Okay, everybody, this one's going to be fun, too. Uh, this is all about how to conduct a successful survey. I know a lot of you guys do surveys. I've done a lot of them. I get asked questions all the time about how do you do surveys and does NPS matter and on and on and on. So this is going to be fun. Uh, we've got another all-star cast, and my job now is to introduce Kelly DeHart. Kelly's a customer success manager at Gainsight. Works for me, and she's going to introduce her panel, and we're going to get this thing going. Come on, Kelly. Everybody get up. Uh, thanks for joining today. Um, we're excited about our panel uh, around how to conduct a successful survey campaign. As I'm sure you guys have seen, uh, this is probably your third one by now. Uh, we'll have our esteemed speakers kick us off, and then we will open it up to question and answer at the end. So look for forward to answering your questions and seeing what you have to say. With me today, we have Tracy Kaufman, uh, VP of Customer Experience at Booker. We have Nick Einstein, VP of Customer Success at Social Chorus. And lastly, Evan Klein, founder and president of Satrix Solutions. And I'll turn it over to Tracy to kick us off. Great. Thank you so much, Kelly. So um, I am Tracy Kaufman, and Booker is a SaaS platform for service providers. It's full service, and it helps them run and grow their business. And I won't spend a lot more time uh, talking about it than that. And so... Um, Oh, about me. Huh, a little about me, yes. So <laughs> I've been in um, the software industry in one way or another for a little over 20 years, and I cut my teeth at Siebel Systems, and so did a whole bunch of surveys there. And, um, and so I've really been focusing on customer success and SaaS for about the last five years or so, and excited to use Gainsight for surveys. Um, ah, clicker. See, that was that. That was that really important thing. Okay. <laughs> There we go, that was me. <laughs> All right, so one of the things as a little known tidbit about me is that when I lived in California and had a very trusty Subaru um, that would never die, I lusted after an Audi, this one that you see right here. And so I thought what would be really cool, because I never got to buy one because it lasted really, really long, and then I moved to New York and nobody needs a $60,000 mm -hmm. paperweight. And so I thought that I would pretend for today's session that I was a new product manager at Audi and I decided to conduct a survey. Um, the, basically, I <clears throat> you know, was new at this and so I went to my customer experience department and asked for some help and I know that you guys have been sitting in the audience listening to things for the better part of the day so I was hoping you'd give me a little audience participation. So just uh, I'll ask some questions, we'll see how that goes but shout out your answer, no need to raise your hands. All righty. So the first order of business is who do you send a survey to? Okay, so that's the first thing you need to know is uh, how am I gonna get my sample? And so who thinks I should send the survey to current customers? Okay, how about all qualified car buyers? Okay, anyone else? Anyone else I should send the survey to? Okay, great, great. Did you see my, my uh, presentation beforehand? <laughs> So the interesting thing about this is that you, know, you want to make sure when you're, when you're deciding who to send a survey to that you're not going to send it to some a sampling that's too narrow because if you ask your current customers what they want, you'll know exactly what your current customers want. But I'm assuming you're going to want to send this to other people. Um, if you ask everybody in the known free world, you're not going to get you know, a really good narrow sampling. So what you should do is exactly what this gentleman said, is you should figure out who your target market is, who you want to sell the new product to, and get a random sampling of those folks. All righty. So the next question is, how do I ask the question? So what if I were to say, which of the following items is most important to you? And I gave you th these three options. Who thinks this is a good kind of initial discovery kind of question? Nobody? Ah, you're too smart for me. So basically, no. The problem with this is that, yep, I'm going to get an answer, but it's way too narrow. You'd want to use this kind of a narrow, closed-ended survey questioning when you already know. If you really want to have your customers or your, your uh, respondents force rank things that you absolutely know are three choices you want to figure out, you know, where you make your investment, it's fine to do this kind of thing. But you notice there's no other. And so let's say you got the answer of price here. Well, you don't have anything around, you know, 
um, cargo space or um, whether it's green or not. And so you'll get an answer, but the likelihood of an accuracy is really not. So make sure not to bias your questions. And also, I strongly recommend before you do a closed-ended survey, you do questionnaire and interviews to get a more under, better understanding of what the key value drivers are. All right, lastly, what rating scale to use? And I'm not talking, we actually had this whole conversation about is it a one to 10? I'm not talking about the one to five, one to 10. But the question would be, you know, most of you I'm assuming are familiar with the satisfaction scale rating. So you ask people, how satisfied are you with each of these items? So let's, let's say that I took these items here and I got price as an eight, gas mileage as a seven, sporty as a six. So from looking at these, I would conclude that sportiness is the area that people are least satisfied with and needs the most investment. Would you agree that that's, that's what you'd conclude from this data? Oh, see, now you think I'm tricking you. No, no, <laughs> I would. I would conclude that. But here's the thing. Let's say I add another question and say, tell me how important each one of these items are to you. Well, this shows a very, very different story, right? Because now you can see that actually, yeah, you know, they're a six with sportiness, but it's only a four important. And so you've got a gap score of a plus two, which in this world means you're over-investing, where on the other end of the scale, your price they might have been most satisfied with, but not satisfied enough compared to how important it was. So one of the things we did is we used this method at Siebel, and uh, yes, it does require that you ask two questions of, the, of every topic, but it really gives you context and context is extremely important when understanding people's responses so that you know how to interpret them. So, summing up, um, three key takeaways. Make sure that you're selecting a sample size that reflects your target audience, that the options you're providing are inclusive of the key value drivers for your customers and your prospects and your target market, and that you know one way to provide to provide context is to use a gap rating scale. All right, thank you. Thanks, Tracy. So. All right, Matt, passing you, the... Uh... Passing the clicker. Uh, <clears throat> thank you, Tracy. It is a pleasure to be here this afternoon. My name is Nick Einstein. Um, I've been doing customer success for, for many years, and uh, how many in this room have had a customer success on their title? for the past, uh, a year ago, or two, two years ago. So, so many of us have been doing this for, for uh, some time. I think uh, when, we used to tell, when you used to tell your friends what you did, did you kind of get a blank look <laughs> occasionally? Or, uh, or worse, sometimes a, a chuckle? Um, I am very excited about uh, the development that this space has gone through. Uh, the, today's conference obviously is a, is a, a, a major kind of uh, uh, symptom of that, and uh, extremely exciting times for us. I am vice president of customer success for a company called Social Chorus. Uh, Social Chorus uh, allows brands, some of America's top brands, to uh, empower their uh, advocates, identify their advocates, and then empower them to uh, create content, um, consume content, and then share that content throughout their social networks. Uh, what we do is measure those actions that their advocates take uh, and, and then uh, measure the impact that those actions have uh, out uh, in, in the social web and then report back to our, uh, our customers on, on those actions and, and continuously optimize and um, uh, drive success with our customer base. Um, before that, I did email marketing for about 15 years, so I was in the email space, and I think that uh, my history probably uh, uh, frames how I view the, the subject today surveys. You know, uh, uh, deep expertise in email, uh, and then having worked for uh, uh, currently an advocacy marketing platform and previously actually as well, um, I am pretty passionate about uh, Net Pro Promoter Score, NPS. Uh, I heard there was some talk about NPS <laughs> on the panel before ours, and, and I'm looking forward to digging into that as well. Um, it's interesting, uh, one quick acknowledgement. Back in the days when I started an email 15 years ago or so, uh, you know, survey data was really one of the few quantifiable metrics we had 
you know, to, to, to weave into our uh, customer success models. And so, um, and, and it was critical then, it's critical now, I'm certainly passionate about it, but I want to acknowledge the fact that now we have many other sources of data, right? Uh, usage data, obviously, we, we wouldn't all be sitting in this room if, if uh, surveys were, were a golden bullet. So I just want to acknowledge on the front end that, that uh, valuable key to, to a, uh, an overall uh, customer success model, but, but not a silver bullet. Um, I'm going to dig into three key strategies, or actually I'm just going to lob three key strategies out there, and then I'm going to allow you guys to kind of fire back. Uh, I, I have a few tactics on the next slide to support them. But um, ultimately, uh, we need to make it easy for our customers to respond to messages, and then we need to religiously focus on optimizing those response rates. Uh, if we don't have response rates, we really have nothing in our surveys, right? Uh, and and uh, we can get into the details, but, but, and I'm sure Evan will, um, you know, when one has low sample sizes, one introduces a whole host of, of issues, uh, biases that can present themselves in, in various forms, uh, to say nothing of just having an incomplete data set. And so, um, uh, making it easy to respond and, and continuously optimizing is key. Um, get strategic about the timing. And, and I think uh, if, if many of you guys have been doing this as long as I have, you've kicked out surveys on a cadence that's made sense to you uh, at times when you need to either uh, get some numbers for a, for a board meeting or potentially uh, you know, some, some data to, to get into your quarterly dashboard. Uh, and, and that's generally not a winning strategy. Uh, ultimately, being able to execute surveys at critical points within your uh, customer's life cycle, uh, not only does it generally generate higher response rates because you're, you're uh, hitting people uh, with relevant messages in, in a timely manner, uh, you generally get better data back too, just uh, for that same reason. It's timely, it's when they're um, uh, interacting, uh, hitting that milestone, and uh, uh, being strategic around timing is, is critical. Uh, and then ensuring the, the results are uh, integrated across uh, your organization and specifically in your customer success uh, system of record. Um, as many of us know, uh, surveys can generate a lot of data. Sometimes that data can be uh, unstructured if it's coming through multiple channels. And being able to efficiently integrate that data, those data, in a place where you can, uh, you know, uh, housed it efficiently, ultimately, uh, you know, uh, uh, make uh, actionable, take actionable insights from it, and then surface those data to the individuals on your team who are going to be taking action. Um, uh, so, so those are the kind of key strategies. I have a few tactics to dig into. Um, one, uh, make it bone simple. Uh, clearly articulate those. Uh, uh, Clearly articulate the goals and next actions. Uh, manage the expectations on the front end. Uh, oftentimes, if um, I, I use a, a framework of kind of the what, so what, now what. You know, what, this is what this survey is, so what, this is why it's important, now what, this is what I'm going to do with these data, and, and how I'm going to follow up. Uh, I think that point's really critical. That, uh, the reasons people don't take surveys, uh, they're too long or people don't see actionable results from them, right? Uh, the best way to, to drive high response rates is to respond to surveys uh, proactively. Get, get back, uh, you know, uh, eh, respond proactively, that could be oxymoron. Uh, but, but respond uh, in a timely fashion and, um, uh, uh, and in a meaningful way. Um, manage commu communications. Uh, you always, so response rates for many email marketing messages are in the 20% range. 20% response rate for your survey is not going to cut it, right? And so you need to, you need to manage expectations not only uh, through, e through email but through the use of your team. Uh, one caveat there is uh, we need to be really careful about not pestering when we're uh, surveying, right? And, and I think uh, we can dig in a little deeper into kind of what that means, but there is a fine line and, and uh, 
you know, solid programs are not built on pestering one's customers, right? Um, become an email marketer, craft those messages appropriately. Uh, there, is a, there are a lot of variables to, to optimize. Email marketing is getting more complex. Uh, and so optimizing to uh, uh, pre-header snippets, from lines, subject lines, all areas where we can realize little bumps, um, little bumps in performance. Uh, I talked a little bit about the key points. Uh, IDing variances is key. You know, oftentimes <clears throat> when we're analyzing data, uh, you'll see uh, variances between segments, uh, either vertical segments, uh, you know, enterprise, uh, uh, corporate, or or uh, within segments of users within certain groups. Your end users are giving you a high score, but the business users, uh, business owners, are lower. And so um, we need to. Uh, it's a mess. Uh, come on, it's, I'm, I'm just <laughs> I'm just going to continue crushing it out here. Music analyst with a broken <laughs> headphone here. Um, uh, but but um, ensuring that uh, you're you're IDing those variances. So so if you got a low score from an end user and a high score from the the uh, person who's signing the check, why is that? Uh, you know we need to dig in deeper. Uh, and then in terms of segmentation. <clears throat> Often, many of us can get uh, a little carried away with segmentation. Uh, ultimately, we want to be able to, uh, you know, by user, by role, by vertical, by stage in the customer life cycle. Um, uh, obviously, we want to be comparing apples to apples, but um, I caution you not to get uh, too ahead of yourself in, in segmentation. Um, I'm going to pass it off to Evan now that his mic is working <laughs> appropriately. Uh, happy to dig into uh, these topics more and Thanks, looking man. forward to it. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, I'm, going to, I'm going to start by addressing the elephant in the room right up front. Yes, my hair is more gray than it is in that picture. <laughs> I'm not sure why that is. It was only taken about a year ago, so it's a little disheartening how it's changed over that period of time. But, so now that you're not going to be as fixated on that during the course of my six-minute presentation here, we can get into the details. Uh, I am the founder and president of Satric Solutions. Um, I'm only going to spend a moment talking about who we are because we have a booth right outside these doors. I encourage you all to stop by. We can you know, share a lot of detail about what we do for our clients. But uh, at a high level, we are a customer and employee feedback consulting firm. Uh, there are a lot of great software platforms represented here today, including our friends who are sponsoring the conference. We, however, are a consulting organization. We will work with you to elevate the impact of your customer and employee feedback endeavors. And so we work with you through the design, implementation, uh, analysis, reporting, uh, and into measuring the ROI and ultimately drive business outcomes because that's what we're here to do. We want to have an impact on retention, on upsell, on referrals, all of these things that ultimately will drive the top line and the bottom line. That's what these programs are all about. And importantly, we want to build a culture within your company. What I've heard today in, in several of the panels, is, which is wonderful, even smaller companies are starting by seeding the DNA with a customer-focused culture. Uh, and that's critical. And continuing to build that culture is an important part of what we do, an important part of your survey program. So I'm going to uh, follow on where uh, Tracy and Nick left off. They did a great job of sharing uh, essentially how you design a survey instrument. Now you've uh, done that in accordance with best practices. You've maximized response rates. You have a wealth of data. You have all of this feedback from your customers. What do you do with it? And so in our industry, just like in any other, there are uh, acronyms. There's a lot of jargon. There's uh, a lot of uh, terms that are, are bandied about. Um, I'm going to throw a bunch of them up on the screen here, and I'm curious, a show of hands after they all display, there are 12 concepts here. They're all related to the analysis of your data and essentially tying that back to your business outcome. So of these 12 concepts and a number of acronyms I, I recognize, a show of hands, how many are familiar with all 12? Okay. So not, uh, I don't know, a couple of hands go up. So that means there's, uh, there's some work for me to do. Now, I will say uh, there, there's obviously not enough time to go through all of these and what they mean, but they all are fairly critical in determining what that data means 
and ultimately what you can do about it. And so you have KPI, Key Performance Indicator. Uh, the, the, we're going to talk about that in, I think, in the, in the Q&A. The five whys is uh, a form of root cause analysis to understand essentially what the root cause of your pain points are. Uh, standard deviation, how dispersed is your data set. Uh, churn rate, we all know. Verbatim analysis, one of the most critical components of analyzing survey data. You get all of this wonderful verbatim rich feedback that you have to comb through. Now, there's software tools that enable you to do that, but ultimately, uh, you have to read, I think, a lot of the comments and, and really dig into essentially what your customers are saying, what they like, and what they don't like. Uh, NPS Net Promoter Score, we've heard a little discussion about that. Uh, key Driver Analysis is KDA. Uh, correlation, which is a, a relationship between two variables to help us understand what our key drivers are. Top two box analysis, margin of error, response bias, customer lifetime value. So these are not very intense statistical tools. Right? I mean, if you have a PhD in stats, you can get a lot further than what's on the screen right here. But so I encourage you, to the extent that you're not familiar with some of these, is to you know, go on to Google, do some searching. You can go on to satricsolutions.com. We have some blogs that we talk about some of these concepts. But really, to make sense of all of this wonderful feedback, you've asked for it, you've gotten a lot of great input, it, it is incumbent upon you to uh, analyze it, make sense of it, and turn it into action, and then follow up with your customers. So once we've done the analysis, uh, now we have to share it, right? We have to share it with all parts of the organization. Now, you know, there are some companies that forward an Excel spreadsheet with a lot of data fields in it. Obviously not the most effective way of doing that. There are some companies that use wonderful tools, right, like Gainsight, dashboarding tools and others uh, to share some feedback. But, you know, really to dig in to the segmentation, to dig into the verbatim analysis, uh, usually a PowerPoint document has to be created at some point, <laughs> right? Uh, and so that PowerPoint document really should cater to a number of different audiences. One is the board of directors. Our, a lot of our clients uh, share high-level detail of their feedback and their customer sentiment with the board. A lot of boards have venture capital investors and private equity people who want to know or should want to know uh, what your customers are saying about you. So high-level input going to your board of directors. Certainly the C-level, they want to dig in. They want to understand... Uh, as much detail as they can about what customers are saying. What do they expect? What's their sentiment? What's their level of satisfaction? Where are their pain points? And, and looking at the different segments of my business, right? So you have to get into the segmentation component of it as well. Then you start looking across the organization at all the business leaders that really should leverage your customer data as well. And you can see it quickly gets to a point where, you know, there's a lot of work to be done. Frontline personnel, absolutely, they should have some insight into what the customers are saying because they're the people on the front lines. They have to react and, and remedy uh, any frustrations. The service team, the product team, right, from a product development, roadmap, feature functionality, you're going to get a wealth of input there. Uh, marketing, what is, what is the, your uh, market, what are the target uh, markets saying about your company? What's the perception of your organization? What resonates? with your target market. Your customers will tell you all this. The marketing team should be chomping at the bit to read the uh, data and the analysis of your uh, customer feedback. The sales team, many of our clients, their sales team are, are among the most eager to get their hands on this, right? Who can I use as a testimonial? Who can I write a case study with? Who's a referral account that I can use for a reference when I'm on a pitch? Uh, what are they saying they love about our service so that, or our product so that I can uh, parrot that when I go on a sales pitch as well. Uh, the human resources group. What type of people are the best fit for my organization? Should I compensate people based on customer satisfaction? So there's a lot of questions there. And the finance team. What level of visibility do I have in my revenue stream? How much revenue is at risk, potentially? Which customers are saying they might uh, not renew or might defect? So you can see how there really is an opportunity to leverage across the company, and you're not capitalizing on your customer data unless you're sharing this with the appropriate people. And then you get to the point where now you have to follow up. You have to follow up with a number of different constituents, and, and Nick talked about that a little bit today. We do what we call the bottom-up follow-up process. That's following up with each survey respondent one-on-one. -on -one. You may not have the resources to get on the phone with all of them, and that may not be required anyway, but certainly in those who are unhappy or frustrated, 
having a phone conversation to dig into that a little bit more and to talk to them about what you can do to improve. The top-down follow-up is let's look for patterns and themes in your survey data. What are a lot of customers saying uh, that maybe we can address that will affect in a positive way a number of our customers? So there's their process improvement, organizational improvement, uh, determination of where we're going to invest our resources. That's top-down, whereas the bottom-up is on an account-by-account -account basis. You have to follow up with employees. You have to continue to preach and share uh, and, and convey the importance of your customer-centric culture. And so sharing what they're doing well and what they're doing you're not doing so well uh, has to be an, an important part of the program. Non-responders, if they didn't respond to your survey, there may be a reason why. They may be apathetic. Uh, they may be disenfranchised. It may be just because they're too busy. But certainly your high-value non-responders, you're going to want to follow up with them as well. Uh, and then uh, what I call the public. Some of our clients may uh, post some level of detail about their customer satisfaction, customer loyalty on their website, uh, or they may talk about it in articles uh, or during interviews. So you know, bandying that about in the public domain is also a nice thing to do and, and set uh, you know, uh, certain expectations for your target market about where you stand on these issues. A lot of companies pay lip service to it, but very few actually differentiate based on uh, an exceptional customer service. So with that, we can turn it over to Thanks, questions. Evan. Oh, it looks like we're ready to go. Need no introduction. Maybe just wait one minute. The mic's almost to you. So I wanted to stick with follow-up. Um, and one of the things uh, I I'm curious about is if you've seen, um, you know, when I think about a, a product company, you know, the best way to follow up would be change the product. Uh, it's also the most expensive, right? So. Um, you kind of get in line with all the other requests. Uh, so if you've seen through your experience, um, aligning a development team to failure demand, right, to the follow-up and the survey results, uh, where have you seen that be successful or have you, have you seen it done anywhere? And uh, tell, tell any stories around that, thanks. Oh, sure, I'll answer that. Um, well, the first order of business is never a ask a question that you don't want the answer to and you're not prepared to do something about. Um, and so what you, because if you ask, your customers are going to tell you, and the only thing worse than not asking the question is asking the question and then not acting on it, because then people will never answer your question again and they'll feel betrayed. And so what I think you need to do is make sure that if you're going to ask a question in a way that gets that kind of feedback, um, first of all, you know, do you have a typical or normal user form? We can support that. Can you give them some guidance on whether that's on the roadmap or not or in your plans or consistent with what you're doing? And so everyone's going to tell you they want the blue you know, button. That's the classic thing. But really the question is, what is the business problem they're trying to solve? And it's not necessarily change the product. It's really getting a deep understanding and talking to that customer after or the group of customers to do a follow-up and say, hey, we, we heard you had some feedback, you wanted to change the product. If, if it wasn't clear from their answer, what did they really need from you that the product's not serving? Because I'm assuming that you'd want to address that. Maybe you don't want to solve it the way they solve it. Does that make sense? Absolutely. Yeah, and, and I'll just add a couple of things. We work with a number of software companies. Uh, what we find is that, and, and we'll survey their users, the decision makers, the implementers, so we'll get all segments of the uh, population and you get a little bit of a different feedback from each user group. Uh, but the, rarely do our clients find something that they've not heard of before, right? So they're not hearing feedback that's a total shock to them. What they are seeing is a degree to which it's more important or less important than they suspected that it was. Mm -hmm. So what they're able to do is move that up or down in the, in the roadmap uh, prioritization process. And so they're able to shift, uh, put something, a feature or functionality enhancement uh, you know, higher up on the list because they didn't realize it was as important. But we have clients that is, uh, will also go back to their customers and say, look, this, I appreciate your feedback. This is not on our roadmap at this time. So they're having an honest discussion with things they're not going to, frankly, incorporate because you can't just, you know, do everything your customers want all the time. Yeah, for, for sure. And I echo that sentiment. I would also add that, that really what they want back is... Uh, <clears throat> an understanding that you're listening to them, you're taking uh, their feedback, 
And even if you're not specifically acting on it, uh, you know, telling them why, telling them what you are doing with the data, uh, keeping those lines of communication open. Great. Anyone on this side of the room? I don't want to ignore you. The light's pretty bright. <laughs> okay. I think right here. Hi. I am, I'm part of a company. We have not issued surveys yet, and we're, we're in the process of doing that. Is there a way to, um, or do you recommend a certain way of when to, when to send it out? And we're also, that's my first question. The second is, is it different for a like service company versus a, a tangible product company in the way that you, you put your surveys together? Yeah, and, and so I think uh, to hit on one piece of that, I think uh, when to send it out, <coughs> In, in terms of kind of day of week and time of day, you can kind of test that. But uh, I, I am a big proponent of sending out surveys at a time when uh, your user is most likely to respond to it, i.e. a kind of strategic point in their life cycle, either when you've just launched them or uh, at, a, at a critical, other critical points in their life cycle. So that A, they're able to, uh, A, they're more responsive to the message, and B, you kind of get better data at that point. Uh, the, the other thing I would add is I would start very small. Uh, don't get carried away with asking too much. Uh, oftentimes, kind of the, the less you ask for, the more you get. And I, I would five gets a little big. I would say, yeah, I would say so. I'd say uh, yeah, four, yeah, five is is getting there. Uh, I like asking when I start out seriously. I like asking one question with a follow up. One question and a follow-up. And so the only thing I'll add, I'll make the distinction. Oh, sorry. Uh, yeah, that's exactly right. So depending <laughs> on the goal, because there's essentially there's transactional surveys and there's the relationship surveys. And to Nick's point, the transaction surveys after uh, a support ticket is filled or you interact with someone or there's a transaction of some kind, obviously, uh, you may have a short survey uh, to follow up and understand how that experience went. For our clients on a relationship survey basis, for some of them we're doing, for example, a semi-annual program where you're inviting all of your customers to respond. Those survey questionnaires are a little bit longer. They might be on the order of 10 or 15 questions. Some of them have two or three. Net promoter surveys are you know, strict ones or two or three questions. Uh, but more often than not, we're digging down a little bit deeper to uncover uh, richer insight. And, and, and think about by the way, a 15-question survey, and this notion of Net Promoter, and we're big fans of Net Promoter, but it, it sort of hijacked the conversation a little bit because, you know, the, in the B2C world, Net Promoter is great because as a consumer, if I purchase something and it's a very quick transaction, I'm not going to give you two minutes of my time to respond to a 15-question survey. But as, in a B2B environment, I'm probably investing tens of thousands or hundreds of thousands of dollars in your product or service, I can, I can afford two minutes twice a year, for example, and that, you can get 10 or 15 questions in, believe it or not, a two or three minute survey. Yeah. Thank you. Okay, I think we've got one question right here. Hi, um, to continue that, for the surveys that you do that do include the MPS question, um, is it, do you do it first? I've heard all different things of if you're going to include it in, as part of a larger survey, you want to include it first so they're not biased by the other questions that you've asked. Or, and I've heard that it's better just to include an MPS survey completely separate, just the one question. So thoughts? So uh, I'll jump on that one because, you know, in, in many regards in the research or the survey or feedback realm, there's not necessarily a right or a wrong answer. Uh, in this case, I would actually say there is. Uh, the research behind Net Promoter dictates that it is the first question posed. And the reason is, is that you want this emotional response. It's the top of mind. You're asking about the, the notion of recommending. Am I willing to put my reputation at stake by talking about your organization in a positive manner? It should be the first question. If you're having uh, you know, a longer survey, you know, then you can drill down into the various attributes or components of what correlate or affect you're likely to recommend. Great. Right here. Um, how do you feel about incentivizing surveys? So saying, thanks for filling out my survey. Here's a $5 Starbucks gift card. Yay or nay? So, so I am really mixed on that one. And I've read a bunch of stuff there. I mean, uh, the, the 
data in the industry says, sure, that's totally fine. And I think the difficulty is that when you incentivize somebody to take a survey, you've already biased them in some way, shape, or form. You're already, you're, you're basically saying, I'm gonna pay you for this. And so there might be some sense of obligation that I need to give you a positive response because you're paying me and some sense of guilt. I think at the end of the day, the question is, are you having problems getting a response? Um, if you're having problems getting a response, then you'll find that there is other ways to you know, incentivize. But are there, is it other than money? You know, can you find another way to encourage your customers? Can you help, or whoever you're serving, can you help them understand why it's important? And so are you surveying your customers or are you surveying other people? Gotcha. All right, and so is there any reason why they would respond other than just you're paying them? Do they have a vested interest, yeah. in other words? Yeah, and that's exactly the question. Is it, you know, or if they're their customers, then uh, hopefully they're going to respond because they want to see an improvement. They want to experience something, a uh, positive change. But if they're not your customers, then it's a different challenge for you. Yep. Yep. In, in a B2B context, generally incentives are frowned upon. Uh, it's the general consensus. The, what we've seen over the past few years, a trend that I actually uh, I like is a donation to a charity. Mm. Maybe that's relevant to your organization of you know, some nominal amount, but per, per each survey that you receive back. And that generally uh, resonates with customers and other people. And, and, and I'll tell you, in the B2B uh, scenario, what, what the best incentive that your customers, uh, I mean, the incentive they really want is for you to take action yeah. and, and listen to them, take action on them. When you can demonstrate you're doing that, uh, that's all the incentive they need generally and, and really the foundation of a good, a good program. Great question. Let's go on this side of the room. Right here. Hi, um, I had a question about the annual customer satisfaction survey. So I did come from Intuit, uh, where that was like our, you know, go-to uh, many years ago. And um, I'm just curious if there still is a place for doing sort of net, maybe the NPS is the new customer sat annual survey that is looking at a data at a slice of time and not s across your entire base as opposed to after a transaction where you're more likely to have maybe a good but biased result. I don't know. Just curious on thoughts. Yeah, I mean, uh, I'll, I'll certainly take a swath. I mean, I think that as long as you know what your goal is, I mean, so if you're surveying people just to survey people to say that I've done this, then whatever. But really for me, the purpose, so every survey has to have a goal at the end. And if you're saying that I'm gonna take this and I'm gonna use it as a baseline to track it, or I'm gonna take this to determine the health of my customer base, that is really useful. Um, and so it, with every one of these answers, it'll always be what is your objective in doing this and what are you going to do with the information once you get it? And do, are your customers going to feel that there's value? And then also, you know, quick anecdote from the past, don't have your salespeople call them up and say, if you, get, if you give me a 10, then I get a better raise. <laughs> True story, I won't mention I the company. I thought that was a great strategy. <laughs> <laughs> right. We, many of our clients, we're doing some cadence to a relationship survey, uh, two times a year, one times a year. Uh, generally not much more than that, um, but we're layering on uh, maybe a transaction survey, an onboarding survey, uh, something, because survey fatigue is an issue, but there's absolutely tremendous value in going out to all of your customers, maybe once or twice a year, getting a wealth of input, segmenting it, sharing it, understanding it, as opposed to just this continuous, you know, 20 year, 30 year, 50 year type of thing. Great. So do we have time for one last question? Oh, and someone already has a mic, so you're the one. Hey there. Um, how many people in here manage, uh, just question for the team and for the group and for the panel. Um, so CSMs, how many CSMs are taking customer sat on as a KPI? How many, how many are measuring against it? I have, I have in the past. Yes. Yeah. In the past. And I will, and I will when I can, yes. Yeah. So compensation tied to that as well? Yeah. Bonus. I, I have indeed, yeah. Yeah, variable, com variable compensation tied to some uh, satisfaction uh, KPI is relatively common, but very cautiously applied, right? So it has to be very well thought out, uh, has to be a lot of education of the staff before you in engage in this uh, practice. 
Uh, you don't want gaming, basically. There's a lot of gaming or incenting of bad behavior. And, and actually, Tracy just alluded to one of the more common, you know, the car companies begging for scores. Uh, so it has to be done carefully. Sure, sure. And, and, and you certainly don't want to, I mean, uh, customer success is a cross-functional role, right? And, and if, if uh, my CSM is getting nailed based on some product, uh, something on the product side, that's, uh, so, so you got to be clear of those potential conflicts. But uh, when those don't exist, it certainly can be one of a metric that we... But, and, and the last thing is, don't make it just for your CSMs. I mean, customer satisfaction is not a CSM job. They are the end of the, the process. And so if you're going to incentivize on customer sat, make it across your product team, your marketing team, your sales team. Great, thank you. So that is all the time we have. Um, I, I recognize there are other questions. Sorry we could not get to everyone, but Tracy, Nick, and Evan will be around. Perhaps you can find them at the happy hour after this next session and have a drink and ask them those questions in person. So thank you for joining. Thank you so much to my panelists. You guys did a great job. Thanks, you guys. Thanks, everybody.